kids and whatever need. So let me now get into um, some system integration issues, um, which I'll try to go through quickly. So in a multi-junction solar cell, typically you have a Fresnel lens, a secondary optic, which is uh, used to homogenize the light down on the solar cell. You've got your solar cell, a package, and then a heat sink. And each of these different components affects the light and light on the solar cell and ultimately the performance that your solar cell is able to deliver. So one of the things is you've got changing sunlight throughout the day. That's something that you have to take into account in designing your solar cells. Your optics are going to attenuate the light that ultimately hits your solar cell. So there's going to be a little bit of a clipping in the UV, some infrared absorb absorption. That affects the spectral content on your solar cell. The Fresnel lens, the secondary optic, they're actually going to reduce the intensity of the light on the solar cell as well. Because you're focusing light down onto a solar cell, you can have a very tight beam, a very tight spot on your solar cell um, as well. The light's coming in at different angles of incidence. Um, as you're tracking throughout the day, you might have a little bit of tracker air that's going to move the beam around onto the solar cell. And these solar cells are, are also typically operating about 40 degrees above ambient. So this is just a whole bunch of issues that you have to design around in order to make these solar cells deliver the most energy yield throughout the year. So let's talk a little bit about temperature. Uh, typically these cells will operate about at 65 to 85 degrees C. As you guys know, band gaps move, and as band gaps move, your quantum efficiency curves shift with temperature. It's about, um, the band gaps move at about half a milli electron volt per degree C. As these band gaps move, however, the amount of current collection that happens in each junction is going to shift. Now, one of the interesting things is your top junction doesn't have another material on top of it. So with increasing temperature, it absorbs more and more light. Every junction underneath that, though, the second, third, fourth, fifth junction, has its band gap increases, so it, it, it's able to absorb more light near its band gap. But the top side, the low energy, excuse me, the low wavelength side of its quantum efficiency actually shifts over to the right, so it's absorbing less light there. And so these are considerations that are taken into account in designing a solar cell under high temperature operation. So here you'll see, go ahead. So typically, it's just a, an aluminum fin heat sink, which then allows you to operate the cells at about 30 to 40 degrees C above ambient. Some people are using uh, water cooling, for example, but that really hasn't proven to be economical in any way. So now, uh, your VOC, because your band gap decreases, your VOC will also decrease as well. But one of the really key points here is because the open circuit voltage in multi-junction solar cells is significantly higher than in traditional single junction solar cells, the VOC degradation uh, coefficient is much, much lower. And this means that CPV performance degradation versus temperature is much less than traditional single junction solar cells. So these typically, um, the efficiency degradation, and I'll just skip to that here, the efficiency degradation versus temperature for a multi-junction solar cell is about 0.06% per degree C. This is a factor of two or three or five smaller than what you find in a traditional single junction PV. And so again, for very, very hot climates, multi-junction solar cells offer some advantage. Now one of the interesting things you can do is you can design a solar cell to operate optimally for high temperature operation. And one of the things that happens is if you look at this plot um, for a four junction cell versus a th uh, three junction cell, the red is a cell solar cell designed for maximum efficiency as room temperature versus that designed for high temperature operation. And you can see when you get to 80 to 90 degrees Celsius, you're seeing very significant differences in efficiency. So I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the uh, design trade-offs here. If you look at this, uh, look at CPV systems as a whole compared to other technologies, it degrades less with uh, temperature compared to other PV technologies. This is inputted into your LC recalculations when you consider annual energy yield. 
So this is a very important consideration uh, when you're doing those kinds of economic calculations. I talked about the optics. So uh, the optics typically attenuate light onto the solar cell. This gives you an example of an acrylic lens and a, and a glass lens system. They have different tra uh, transmission when you look at the UV and the infrared. That poses significant challenges in how you design your solar cell. So a solar cell designed for AM 1.5D operation uh, for a world record will be a very different cell than what you design for integration into a system. Just gave you a few, an, another plot here showing you um, some different materials that are used and their transmission functions. Now some systems focus the light down onto the solar cell to varying degrees. Some systems give you a nice even profile of the light beam down onto the solar cell and some systems actually give you a very very tight beam. Now one of the things that happens due to distributed resistance if you focus the beam very very narrowly on your solar cell, the amount of distributed resistance loss you have in your solar cell increases and that manifests itself as a reduction in fill factor. That's a very important consideration that we have to make in designing our solar cells. Another factor is chromatic aberration. So all lenses have an index of refraction which is dependent on wavelength. So all of these lenses will focus light um, to different spot sizes. So the size of the spot on the solar cell at 500 nanometers is going to look very different than the spot size of the light at 1,000 nanometers, and that's going to be different from the light um, at 1,500 nanometers. These different in spot sizes give you different amounts of series of distributed resistance loss within your multi-junction solar cell. In fact, this can give you, in this particular case, a very big decrease uh, in fill factor, as you can see from this purple curve to this green curve. This is something you can engineer within your solar cell, but it's another design issue that we have in CPV that you don't have in traditional um, flat plate PV. Yes, in many cases that's true, yes. Typically it's going to be totally different. Yeah. It's a pretty big design uh, change. Um, tracking error, as, you, as your tracker st uh, tries to stay, stay pointed at the sun, the beam moves on the cell, you can have transient losses in fill factor as well. I'm going to s skip all this for the sake of time. One of the things that's very important, as I mentioned, is your solar spectrum changes throughout the day and throughout the year. And one of the things that's very interesting is you can then design a certain set of band gaps which will then give you maximum energy yield throughout the year. And so this was a study done um, at Fraunhofer ESA looking at some different technologies which I'm about to tell you about. And you can see different band gap combinations and number of junctions can change your energy harvesting efficiency throughout the, throughout the year. So now let me get into um, what I think is the most interesting part here, which is the technology and kind of what's going on in the industry. So if you look at a triple junction solar cell today, what we're using is indium gallium phosphide as the top junction, gallium arsenide or 1% indium gallium arsenide as the middle junction, and germanium as the bottom junction. The germanium produces way too much current. It's not current matched. And one of the problems with these solar cells is you're delivering power at a lower voltage than you would if you had an optimal set of band gaps. Now, what do these solar cells do? Typically, they're about 39 to 40%. The world record in this was about 41.6%, but the production average today is about 39.2 to 39.8%. So, what are some ways to improve efficiency? One way of doing that is to actually decrease the band gap of the top two junctions. So you can actually change the band gap of indium gallium phosphide and indium gallium arsenide. So you achieve something that's more current matched between each of the three junctions. And in this case, your theoretical efficiencies are substantially higher than the case I just showed you. Another way to increase efficiency is to actually get rid of germanium as the bottom junction and replace that with another compound semiconductor, in this case, either indium gallium arsenide or indium gallium arsenide nitride. Um, which has a higher band gap and is going to give you better current matching 
between each of the three junctions. And that's what we've actually done at Solar Junction um, to achieve 44% compared to about 40%, which is what's done today. Now, going beyond that is where things get really interesting. So triple junction cells today, the best you can do is about 44, maybe 45% is what we'll see in the coming years. And then as you go to a four, five, and six junction cell, you're gonna have to split up the solar spectrum into smaller and smaller bins. Now, the real challenge here is finding a new set of materials to give you the band gaps that you need. And I've listed out a lot of the development challenges, but there's one challenge here that really sticks out from everything. And it's the uh, infrared absorbers, the junctions that absorb between about 900 nanometers and about 1.5 microns, which really pose the greatest challenge. And the reason why is, if you look at band gap versus lattice constant, in between gallium arsenide and germanium, there isn't a set of materials which is lattice matched to germanium or gall gallium arsenide. And this has caused the industry to look at a whole host of different solutions so that you can get the band gaps that span that range. So some of the different technologies I'm gonna talk about are metamorphic semiconductors, there's some different flavors of uh, what people have looked at, quantum walls and quantum dots, new lattice match materials, this is what we're working on at Solar Junction, and then semiconductor wafer bonding. I'm not gonna talk about everything comprehensively, there's some other approaches as well, but these are the main approaches that are being used, that are being looked at in the industry. So if you wanna get the right band gaps, particularly in the infrared, the only way that people know how to do this, outside of what we're doing at Solar Junction, is to actually change the lattice constant within your epitaxial stack. Now, one way of doing that is to vary, as you grow these materials, is to very slowly change the lattice constant so that you effectively change the, lattice, the, the template. So when you do that, for example, you can go from, in this case, germanium, to a larger lattice constant by introducing what they call a metamorphic graded buffer layer. And what you do is you grow different gradations of indium gallium arsenide where you slowly increase the amount of indium in your buffer layer so that you can then relax a whole bunch of stress through threading dislocations and then end up with, a, with pretty clean material on top. And people have been successful in doing that. Uh, this gives you an idea of how people have designed these step graded buffer layers. Now one of the problems is that there's a lot of defects in these materials. And as you know, defects are no good for solar cells. They are recombination centers. There's been a lot of uh, work done in this area where all of the defects can be confined to these graded layers where the minority carriers never really travel. If you look at this, uh, this is actually a study done at Spectrolab. As you go to higher indium contents, where you can then access lower and lower band gaps, you get more dislocations and more uh, basically challenges. In this case, this was done for 44% indium, which is way out around, um, I think, 1.3 microns. Um, now, one of the interesting things is by confining those defects to the graded buffer layers, you're still able to get very good material and make individual junctions that have excellent um, current drives and output voltages. And what have people been able to do? So Spectrolab did this about um, five or six years ago. They were, this was actually the first cell to actually break 40%. Uh, they got 40.7%. Uh, the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany uh, broke 41% a few years later. Uh, Spectrolab did this again at 41.6%. Now, what are the problems with this technology? Um, one of the things, one of the challenges is you start with a germanium substrate, you then grow your graded buffer layer, and then the problem is the materials that you grow on that tend to suffer from, from some defects. And so that technology ended up not being very manufacturable. Even though some nice efficiencies were, were reached, people decided to move away from that technology. And what they did was they went to now what they call an inverted metamorphic uh, architecture. And in this case, things get a lot more challenging. What you do is you start off with a gallium arsenide substrate. You grow your entire solar cell stack upside down. So you start 
with your indium gallium phosphide, which is going to be your top junction. Then go to your gallium arsenide middle junction. Then you do your buffer layer, which is going to change your lattice constant. And then you're going to grow your indium gallium arsenide with the right lattice constant and band gap that you need. Now the problem is, you then have to go into some relatively complicated wafer processing. You have to take your wafer, flip it over onto what they call a handle substrate, and then peel off that epitaxy. And then you end up with a just your solar cell epitaxy on a support subfate. Like it could be a piece of glass, a piece of plastic, it could be a piece of metal, whatever you want. Um, that's very complicated. Um, one of the problems with this technology is the thickness of your epitaxy is significantly thicker than what you'd have in a lattice match configuration. And then your epitaxial liftoff and bonding to another substrate is costly and introduces a whole bunch of challenges. So it can be done. People have been working on this and Alta Devices has been very successful in developing this technology. It's really nice in that you can actually come up with a flexible solar array, which for some applications is um, very interesting. Uh, the other thing people would like to do is as you peel the epitaxy off of the substrate, you have the opportunity to reuse that substrate. The substrate is about one third the cost of a solar cell. So if you could reuse that substrate several times, you're then amortizing that substrate cost, which could then re reduce the cost of the solar cell. Um, this technology was first uh, developed by NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Lab. They um, got 39%, uh, just about 39% back in 2007, and these results have gotten better and better over time, about 41% uh, back in 2008. And then these results were presented last year at a CPV conference, about 42.5% both at NREL and MCOR, which is one of the large companies in this space. And then Sharp, which is a Japanese company, actually tied Solar Junction's first world record uh, and they did this on a one centimeter cell and got 43.5% um, at a concentration of about 300 cells. Spire, which is a company uh, based in uh, New Hampshire, did uh, a different architecture where they grew the top two junctions lattice match to one side of the wafer and then grew a metamorphic buffer layer and then metamorphic indium gallium arsenide on the other side of the wafer. So it's kind of a hybrid approach and they were actually able to get a world record at that time of 42.3%. So what I'm trying to do is give you a flavor of the vi very different change in technology that people have done in order to access the infrared part of the solar spectrum. And again, that's just a really key point here, is because there isn't a set of lattice match compounds between germanium and gallium arsenide, people have now had to move to very different epitaxial conditions and a very different set of wave processing.